Hello, welcome to another edition of Canada Files. I'm Jim Deeks. Our guest on this episode is Kalen Rovanescu, the president and CEO of Canada's biggest airline. Air Canada is also recognized as one of the world's most successful international carriers. But it's a company that some Canadians seem to love to complain about. Kalen Rovanescu seems to be up to the challenge, however. Born in Romania, he came to Canada with his family at the age of five. Grew up to be a prominent lawyer in Montreal, working for his client Air Canada during the 1980s and 90s, and later was a co-founder of a major investment bank in Toronto. He's been running Air Canada for just over 10 years, and today is considered one of the most successful and visionary executives in the worldwide airline industry. Kalen, you've been the CEO of Air Canada for 10 years now, and after a rough first few years from 2009 onward, certainly for the last five years, you seem to have piloted the ship or the aircraft rather smoothly. You've now achieved record profits, record revenues, record passenger volumes. The stock price when you took over 10 years ago was trading at under a dollar. Today it's almost $50 a share, which is remarkable for a major corporation. So what did you do or what has happened to be able to turn this aircraft around? Well, yeah, Jim, thank you very much for that. So, you know, we've uh, embarked uh, in 2009, uh, we were facing a, a classic near death situation. And the first order of business when I came in, and actually I came in on April Fool's Day, 2009, my friends thought that it was Good timing. My, my version of a poor uh, April Fool's joke. But when I came in on April Fool's Day in 2009, uh, the company was low on cash, low on morale, low on customer service, low on liquidity, high on pension deficit, uh, bad uh, uh, labor relations. And so there was a lot that had to be fixed. Yeah. And the first order of business was actually, uh, you know, just stabilizing, it's just like a patient that is uh, bleeding everywhere, it needed to be stabilized. And so we had to raise enough liquidity to stabilize the picture quickly. Uh, if you, of course, know 2009 was just on the heels of the 2008 financial Sorry. crisis. So banks were not lending. Uh, it was a really, really bad, bad situation at the time. And you had fuel price contracts that you were beholden to that were costing you a fortune when the when the costs had actually gone down. For well, what, yeah, exactly fuel. what had happened is that fuel had spiked in the 2008 time frame to $140 a barrel and then came down very, very quickly. And so, you know, by definition, some of these hedges were very, very complicated to unwind. So, so it was a really bad, bad situation. But the good news, and I think this is a, a, a almost a, a business lesson for lots of other companies, lots of other industries, is that the best time to effect change is when you have a burning platform. And we had a burning platform in spades at the time. And, and our, our vision was, was not only to fix the, the balance sheet and not only to fix the financial picture and not only to fix the pension and not only to fix the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the liquidity level of the company, but it was to actually stabilize the company for long-term sustainable growth and to actually change the culture. So I'd say that that probably, when I look back and you talk about the last five years being very successful, it was the stuff that we did in the first five years that we were able to reap in the last five years. And part of that was a, a fairly fundamental and long-term culture change at the company. And you know, it's very Canadian for all of us to complain about Air Canada. In spite of the success that you've made of the airline, people still love to complain about it. Does that drive you crazy when you realize the success you've, you've achieved? Well, no, you know, the thing is, it, it's, a, it's a great uh, privilege to fly the maple leaf on our tail. And, and, and this is uh, one of the, uh, when we look at, at uh, you know, in any country that we fly to, you know, we fly to Brazil, we fly to India, we fly to China, we fly to Japan, any of these countries, and if you were to ask you know, them to name uh, the top five or the top 10 Canadian companies that they know, chances are, Air Canada would be on most people's list. So it's a big, big uh, privilege and a big responsibility we take on ourselves, and we're very, very proud of that. And I think that while you know, uh, you know, customer service has improved dramatically, and I think as, as you know, and we, we, we actually talk about it on virtually every flight, that Air Canada has been recognized as uh, the best airline in North America, and the Skytrax, which is really like the Academy Awards of the airline industry, uh, we, we are not spiking the ball you know, yet in, in victory that, that uh, we've achieved all that. So, so I, I'd say that you know, we, we take 
uh, our uh, perspective and our responsibilities quite seriously in terms of continuing to improve the product, continuing to push the envelopes, continuing uh, to grow, and continuing to add you know, what we consider to be very uh, uh, sort of key uh, ingredients to our, to our customer offering. Let's go back a few decades and talk about you and your life and your beginnings because your life actually reads a little bit like a modern Charles Dickens novel, perhaps Great Expectations. You arrived with your parents and your older sister literally off the boat from Eastern Europe in 1961 in Montreal with, as the story goes, a couple of suitcases and maybe a couple of hundred dollars in your dad's pocket. Take it from there. Was it, was it difficult for your family to adapt to a new life in Canada or was it easy? Well, you know, it's, first of all, it was $60 in their pocket, not even wow. a couple of hundred dollars. The entire, their entire net worth was $60 and these suitcases and uh, a uh, uh, willing and helpful uncle uh, that my mother had that had sponsored uh, their immigration uh, to Canada. Um, so, you know, I'd say that the, the, the number one thing that they had going for them uh, and the number one driver and, and the energy that they had was based around higher education. My father was a, was a physician, uh, uh, a urologist, so a specialist, uh, and, uh, and my mother had two master's degrees, had highly educated uh, uh, people. And so their perspective was we can show up with, with no money and what we have in our heads will be what will propel us. And so that has been something that was always ingrained in us, that you know, sort of we shouldn't feel sorry for ourselves, we didn't have much. We shouldn't feel sorry for ourselves that we're starting you know, sort of in the poorer parts of town when, when uh, in Montreal we were living on a street called Barclay, which is one of the you know, poorer streets in the, in the city because that was you know, basically a, an apartment uh, that my, um, my, my mother's uncle was able to you know, get us on very favorable terms. And uh, my father went to do his internship and residence all over again because of course his, uh, his certifications from Romania were not fully recognized. His medical degree was, but not the uh, specialty, so he had to redo that. My mother worked clerical jobs, beside, despite the fact that she had these, uh, you know, fairly higher education uh, uh, situation, and and that gave them the confidence. And so we talk about, in many respects, the so-called uh, American dream. They actually were deliver, they lived the Canadian dream, call it, and and it was a, a country that gave them a tremendous amount of uh, confidence in terms of building their family, uh, you know, having giving us opportunities like we've had. And then you know, one of the great ironies, of course, now as important as education was for them, I ended up, in addition to this role, I'm the Chancellor at the University of Ottawa. Yes. And, uh, and, and just very recently we've, we've announced that we're, uh, my wife and I are creating scholarships for uh, first generation Canadians at the University of Ottawa and at the University of Montreal. So we'll have in perpetuity a certain number of students per year that will be beneficiaries of, uh, of this who are first generation Canadians. That's wonderful of you and your wife. Clearly education was a message instilled in you by your parents, the need for a good education. You ended up getting a law degree in Montreal, graduating in 1980, I believe, and then very quickly you went to work for one of the blue chip national law firms in Canada, Steichman Elliott, which exists uh, today and still is one of the blue chip firms. What was your outlook for yourself when you first started as a lawyer? Did you just see yourself being a practicing lawyer, obviously you didn't think you'd end up running an airline at that point. You know, the, 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 thing, the mistake that many lawyers make is they get pigeonholed and have a too narrow a view on what their perspectives should be. And the good thing about Steich Minnelli, despite the fact that it uh, you know, was a very recognizable uh, blue chip, as you say, uh, law firm, it was still very entrepreneurial. It was still very much a first generation firm. The founders, Hewitt Steichman and Fraser Elliott, were still not only alive and well at that time, but very active. And so we, were, we saw it really an entrepreneurial success story, and that culture uh, gave people like me the opportunity to do lots and lots of different things. So actually I started out uh, in an industry that would be of interest to you, in the film industry. Yes. Uh, you know, so I did my original uh, indoctrination was doing film deals as part of the Canadian tax shelter environment. And, and those film deals were complicated securities deals, financing deals, uh, partnership deals, joint ventures, you learn the whole rigmarole. And that, I think, was a, a great education uh, for many things that I would do subsequently uh, in life. And I think that uh, while I certainly did not expect to end up running an airline when I started practicing law, 
I, I also was not uh, uh, certain that I would practice law forever. I nonetheless did it for close to 20 years. Uh, and uh, it was a fantastic, uh, fantastic time, but it was a great basis for lots of things that I've done subsequently. Well, it also got you into the airline industry because you ended up with Air Canada as one of your primary clients at Steichman Elliott and worked on the privatization yeah. of Air Canada in 1988-89, which up to that point had basically been a crown corporation, right. government run. Was that the right decision at the time to take Air Canada away from government management and make it a privately run corporation? Right, you know, the, the, the timing of 88, 89 was uh, just on the heels of the British privatizations. So this was during the Mulroney uh, years. And uh, we had just seen in England, you know, through the Thatcher years, the privatization of British petroleum, British gas, British airways. And Air Canada was the first of the major Canadian privatization, sort of crown corporations that were perceived to have a better future in the private sector than in uh, owned by the uh, by the public as a crown corporation, and and there has been a lot of discussion around airline privatizations, particularly because most countries around the world had started in a similar way that Air Canada had, which is state ownership, and that has largely broken down now ar around the world. I would say, uh, Air Canada, of course, is privatization was 30 years ago. But, but now you know, virtually every country in the world has either considered it uh, or not considered it. And in many cases where they hadn't considered it, it le has led to catastrophic failures in most cases. South African Airways, who actually is one of our uh, partners in Star Alliance and yes. so on, uh, is, is going through a very rough uh, patch. They grounded a large portion of their fleet, state-owned en state enterprise. Uh, uh, Air India, uh, uh, it's going through its challenges. There are some discussions about possible privatization on and off for the last number of years. Very, very you know, bad financial picture. Alitalia, uh, several of the African uh, countries, uh, several of the Eastern European countries have seen these airlines disappear. So I think the, the you know, it, it is almost a, 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 a contrary uh, objective dynamic for uh, state-owned enterprises, state-owned airlines in particular. Uh, the objective is to not have a burden on the public purse, to be able to have airlines that are actually competitive and that can deal with a cost structure and a labor structure that's competitive, but at the same time continue to serve national interests. But even with the privatization that happened in 1989, the airline still ran into serious financial difficulty in 2003 and then again in 2008, 2009. So being a private and publicly traded company doesn't necessarily mean that it's smooth sailing and necessarily a better business model. Right, right. No, look, I, this is a highly, highly competitive industry. And I think that the, the first, uh, uh, the privatization of Air Canada, 88, 89, uh, was I would say the first chapter of uh, you know, Air Canada entering the, the private sector and competing more seriously with private sector companies. So it then went about its merry way for, for the next period of time. Uh, and then by 2000, of course, 2003, you're absolutely right, was the restructuring. Uh, and the restructuring was as part of an overall restructuring of the North American airline industry. Over Which had just suffered 9/11. Had a suffered 9/11. Correct. Had suffered 9/11, and in Canada, you know, we had, we had sort of a, a triple whammy of 9/11, SARS uh, at the time, which yes. was you know affected uh, uh, the Toronto hub of Air Canada uh, more than any other city in the world, other than Hong Kong, and uh, and then of course uh, the the uh, bursting of the technology bubble, which which of course occurred in 2001. So that those those several uh, ingredients uh, conspired to to make it such that. Uh, Air Canada restructured, I'd say, along with the rest of the North American industry. But the good news was it emerged, whereas a lot of other carriers, both inside the US and Canada and uh, in Europe, disappeared completely. And we saw you know, great companies like you know, in, in, in the US, uh, TWA, Pan Am, Eastern Airlines uh, completely disappear off the face of the planet. In Europe, uh, you know, Swiss Air and uh, uh, Sabina and uh, in Australia, Ansett. So there were, this was a carnage at the time. In Canada, you had companies like Canada 3000 and, and Royal Aviation and Jets Go and uh, Canadian Airlines, frankly. So you had the disappearance of many, many, many airlines over that time. It was a bit of a carnage. Now, in terms of competition, Air Canada, it took Air Canada, I would say, the better part of two decades to become uh, truly a, a private sector oriented corporation. And when I came in as CEO in 2009, we actually started working on what culture does it take to be a world competitive airline. And we migrated and we've been talking about this as a, 
as a mantra, if you like, for the company, uh, you know, to, to, to create something that is a global champion. But you know, Kalen, uh, while you've done a magnificent job with the airline and you've kept it afloat, you would be old enough to remember, I certainly am, the glory days of flying when getting on an airplane was something you looked forward to. Now it's not something that you look forward to, you might even dread it. The seats are smaller, the leg room is reduced, the food and drinks cost money, the baggage costs money to put in, in the hold. It's just not the pleasure it was. What the heck happened to those glory days? <laughs> well, it's a great question, Jim. You know, we we get this fairly often. Uh, you know, who, people who pine for the uh, for for the for the good old days. The reality is that aviation has created uh, enormous opportunities for travel for people who could never have afforded the travel uh, during the so-called glory days. And this has been partly the emergence of the so-called low-cost carriers, the ultra-low-cost carriers that you know, put additional pressures on the competitive dynamic, which means that you, know, you end up competing for a certain segment of the market. And so what, what, what uh, you, you actually see is now that in virtually every country in the world, you'll have a segment of the business, whether it is the so-called historic legacy carriers who've get, gotten into this lower segment of the market, or new entrants who come in for a period of time, uh, and, and disrupt the market. So what you've seen is open market forces uh, creating opportunities, especially for people who could never have traveled before. And now we're seeing it, frankly, in spades in countries like India and China, where the middle class could never have traveled before. Of course, they're able to travel. And you know the idea in, in Europe, for example, that you can get on a flight in London and expect to get to, to uh, Athens or something like that for hundred yeah or a hundred bu bucks or something like that is kind of you know a, 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 I'd say a ridiculous uh, uh, dynamic when of course the costs of the the aircraft, the pilots, the training, uh, the fuel, et cetera, et cetera, are well above that. So, you know what what it is 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 I would say a a com highly competitive industry that has reorganized itself several times over the last number of years. And Air Canada has been able, and this is one of the reasons we've been successful over the decade, we've been able to respond to different market segments. We have the top end, the so-called premium traveler, where we've been you know, winning our awards, signature service, and so on and so forth. Um, and then we have our lower end uh, product. Uh, you know, we've created uh, Air Canada Rouge as a, as a, uh, a lower cost yes. uh, operation, which you know, gives people an opportunity to, to benefit for leisure travel and so on and so forth. A bit like Marriott, you know, might have the high end, you know, Ritz Carlton is part of the Marriott offering, and they might have Courtyard by Marriott as a lower end offering for some. So that's sort of been the model we've followed. You've also benefited though, as you mentioned, from a lot of airlines basically going out of business. Yes. And you yourself are taking another one of those airlines out of business with your purchase of Air Transat which for our American viewers who may not know that airline, it's been a very popular holiday-making airline and with a focus on Europe, you've announced that you're buying it. Are you not taking just some of the comp competitive edge away from yourselves and therefore will prices go up even further now that you've taken some of the competition away? No, so, so first think of Air, Air Transat as being uh, a, a very important player in that leisure space that I'm just uh, referring to. So they're actually one of the best leisure airlines in the world. They've, they've won all kinds of awards for a good leisure offering at a competitive price. Uh, Canada uh, and Europe, for example, have what, what's called complete open skies. So any carrier from Europe can come to Canada as it pleases, so whether it's a carrier from, uh, from the EU countries or from now the United Kingdom, depending on where the United Kingdom en uh, ends up. So that's British Airways, Air France, uh, Lufthansa, uh, Level, uh, uh, Norwegian, uh, any of these carriers could come at their heart's content. So, so the competitive dynamic is actually extremely, extremely active. Likewise, Canadian carriers, and we of course know that our main domestic competitor, WestJet, has got major ambitions to go over to Europe. So this, this is a, a very, very open competitive dynamic with, without barriers to entry. And that is the best way to kind of control pricing. You know, we're, we're in a deregulated pricing environment, so prices are put into the market based on competitive dynamics. Also for people who are extremely price sensitive, they could also you know, do a one-stop one connection either in Europe or in the United States. So if you kind of think the way the world is evolving and you will look at North America as one market, and, and you know, Air Canada's piece of the overall North American market is, of course, not that large. 
And you look at, say, Europe, uh, EU as one market, flying from North America to Europe is a highly competitive. Because once you get into North America, in addition to what I've just said, you also have American Airlines and Delta, and et cetera, you know, United. Competition, obviously, is one of your biggest challenges. What are some of the others? What keeps you awake at night? Well, you know, the, the, this, is, uh, this obviously is a uh, uh, very, very complicated business. As I like to say to lots of my friends in other industries, this is not like making, uh, with due respect to people who make t-shirts, this is not making t-shirts or underwear or extracting minerals from the ground. Uh, I think this, you know, the, the, our, the logistics of our business, the complexity of our business, the number of extraneous factors are much, much greater than most other industries. And so we get affected by fuel prices. So we talked earlier about the fuel, fuel price spike in 2008. Well, you know, we see fuel bouncing around. Fuel for us is a $4 billion a year number. If it spikes 10%, well, that's a $4.4 billion number. And, and this sort of thing is, is, a, is a big you know, factor for us. The geopolitical events, you know, having just seen what, what uh, you know, our country has gone through with China, uh, our business with China, which is a big investment for us, is you know, down 25 to 30% overnight like that, based on a, based on a dynamic that between the two governments. Uh, uh, you know, we've had uh, major disruptions as a result of the Pakistan-India uh, uh, dynamic, you know. So, so geopolitical events affect us, weather events affect us, the, you know, catastrophic storms we saw last year, hurricanes and so on, uh, you know, damaged a big part of our business. Uh, our, so, so this and is a, the pressure of climate change and the and environment. And the pressure of climate change, absolutely. Yeah. So, th so this is a business that depends very, very much on extraneous factors, and, and we try to control them the best we can. But as someone once characterized this business, and, and you know, we've, we've built that mantra in the company that we're going to be flexible and adjust to all of this, this is a business that has a, a virtual uh, full fixed cost uh, infrastructure, and virtually all of our revenue is variable. What do you see ahead? for the airline industry in the next 10 to 20 years. More consolidation, uh, even greater challenges, perhaps again from the whole issue of climate change and your carbon, carbon footprint. What are, if you had a crystal ball, where would you say we'd be in 10 years? Well, you know, the, the, there will be definitely some more consolidation in, in, in some parts of the world, I, I would think. I think that, that uh, airlines, the best thing for overall economies, for airlines to be solid, sustainable, and Durable, and and I think that we're showing that. I mean, the fact that we have been as strong as we've been over the last decade has made it such that we've contributed enormously to the Canadian economy. You know, we've built our our, our hubs in Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver enormously. Uh, we have a lot of you know connecting traffic from the United States, and I know there's many U.S. Uh, uh, listeners on this show. Uh, you know, many many Americans are connecting through our Canadian hubs to go to all of our. Uh, international destinations and because we're seen as the best airline in North America that business is flowing in that's very very good for our economies so you know our our dynamic has been you know the stronger we've gotten the better it has been for each of our uh, main hubs and therefore for each of the provinces that those hubs are located in uh, on the climate side you know there's no question that that uh, airlines will need to do uh, more than their fair share because of the perception of what uh, aviation means and you know what it consumes and so as an industry, we've adopted uh, a, a global standard uh, for uh, emissions and, and how we look at compensating for emissions uh, called CORSIA. This has been something that was adopted at the level of ICAO and, and ratified by the main airlines. Uh, but we at Air Canada have uh, taken several, several steps beyond that. You know, our, we were recognized a couple of years ago as the uh, number one eco airline of the world. Uh, and what I think part of the reason we were recognized for that is our early adoption of uh, new technology aircraft and uh, sort of aircraft that consume materially less fuel uh, per seat. Uh, and so we bought the 787. We were early adopters of the 787 and then the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the C-Series, which became the Airbus A220. Bombardier, yes. Bombardier C-Series became the A220. And, and we've changed our ground equipment and we're now investing in alternative fuels. Uh, so there are many, many initiatives like that. And our expectation as, a, as an overall industry is that you know, we will be carbon neutral by 2050. And I think that, that is a big objective. Well, Kaylin, thank you. You've done a great job with Air Canada. Continued success to you. Thanks for joining us on Canada Files. Thank you very much, Jim. And thank you for joining us. Hope to see you next time with more Canada Files.
The preceding program was made possible through the generous support of Andrew and Valerie Pringle, as well as the following donors. The John and Jocelyn Barford Family Foundation, Mary Alice Davis, in memory of Glenn W. Davis, John and Margaret Deeks, Wendy Deeks, in memory of Peter A. Deeks, Richard and Donna Ivey, Alice and Ted Kernahan, the Bruce H. Mitchell Foundation, Eleanor and Francis Shen, the Sonner Foundation, the Browning Watt Foundation, William E. Wilder, and by the Central Canadian Public Television Association.